uh, I look forward to this. I know you're not actually my children or anything, but this is a moment of great pride for people like me. So I, I greatly look forward to this, and uh, I've enjoyed those of those of you I've worked with over the last couple of weeks uh, on this. It's been a lot of fun. So if I don't run into you later, I've, I'm grateful. I want to thank the judges who are uh, not getting paid any more than you are, and. Uh, um, are here not to meet me, but to meet you. So um, as you get breaks and so on, please, um, they, they don't do all this because of us. They do it because it's a great opportunity to interact with you guys and get your thoughts and what your generation is doing to change the world. And it's, it's pretty exciting for all of us. So here's our judges, uh, Julia, which is from Springdale, which is my wife's name. Uh, Accenture is uh, on our board. Uh, Serrano, this is, uh, been active with us since the very first uh, day. Um, he's been to all these all these things. Chrissy and um, Ted, um, who I've uh, just met myself, but uh, again, uh, people who are very experienced in this stuff and uh, uh, look forward to interacting with you and seeing what you have in, in mind. Um, so I have actually the easy job, which is um, Diamond Digital, you guys are up? Is it just you? Just me, right? yes. <laughs> Oh, is there another slide? Am I supposed to point at you for another slide? Oh, yeah. So Catherine already yelled at you about this stuff. So the clock's on there. When it hits seven minutes, uh, if you finish earlier, great. You'll give the judges more time to interact with you. If, uh, if you get through it uh, seven minutes, you give them only one minute. Um, please feel free to, to talk with them afterwards. Some of you have much more content that will fit in seven minutes. Um, you'll be presenting probably in your classes for a 20-minute uh, sort of pitch or something later. Um, so I know you have plenty of content, um, but try to get some feedback um, because you'll be better for it and you'll be able to make some changes. So why don't you go ahead and let's see. I'm not sure what I'm pointing at now, but uh, uh, Diamond Digital. Okay, Absolutely. Again. All yours. So. Schmeers. So I'm here with Diamond Dig and on behalf of Diamond Digital, which is which my team consists of Thomas Couples, Lane Witt, and Tavish Noel. And so what we did is we worked on this pro concept called Blockbuster. So one of the things that we wanted to showcase with this is the utility of NFTs. NFTs, they're slowly becoming bigger than art. We're seeing them move to party invitations, concert passes, softer utility. Gary Vee is opening a restaurant in New York where you have to have the NFT to show that you have access to this. Concert passes such as Coachella, you have a lifetime access to it if you buy that NFT. And software utility, our professors are using Builder and so are we to use some of these software cases. We've seen the utility of NFTs growing more than art. We're also seeing some possible cases for what it can be as well. So, for examples here, we can have a Razorback season pass. So imagine all 22, 2022, you have access to the Jones, you have access to a Jones-styled, uh, what should we call it, suite. And so you can have access to that with an NFT. You have secured liquidity positions. This one already exists through Uniswap. So imagine, you know, if, if Ethereum cashes out bad, poorly, then you can just do that. Or Netflix, you know, uh, American Airlines, they offered a $250,000 uh, lifetime access uh, a few years way few years back and so we can imagine Netflix doing something like that in the future where you buy lifetime access for you know 50,000 you get an NFT for that so some of the reasons I point that out is because the question I want to raise is how do we create inclusivity within an exclusive environment so our team at Blockbuster we, we decided to we decided to team up with TokenProof to provide a layer of security with dynamic QR codes which can only live on one device at a time. And this can expand to, on existing code to promote inclusivity by renting NFTs. So I want to first show everyone a working prototype. You can pull up your phones. So there's a QR code here. And uh, this actually showcases what we currently have working right now. We were able to just build this up and uh, you know, this should be working and whatnot.
just give me a thumbs up if you if you have it going, and then we can continue going while you look at it. Okay. All right. Is it live where I can connect my wallet? So, so right now it's just kind of theoretical. Okay. So you don't have to actually connect your wallet, but you press the connect and the sign in stuff, mm -hmm. and it'll show you what you know theoretically it would look like. So, what this does, or what token proof does, is instead of having the let's use Coachella for an example. So where you'd have the Coachella key, and you'd showcase that to get in there, you have this middleman. Unfortunately, this so this should usually play. And if you go to, if you go on your little app and you click the middle button, we have a uh, we have a theoretical one of how that would look. And you can you can click on that on the artwork, and it'll show you what that would look like, where it's constantly changing, no matter what the NF, on the NFT to showcase that it's that specific NFT. So we have a live example of what this would look like if we go to the next slide. So this event was, oh, there we go. So this event was a few days ago, and so this is token gate event. So none of the people at this line are have their NFTs on them. So for added security, they're able to just scan it through that. So what we want to do is we want to present this as an idea of renting this. So with the ideas that presented earlier, you know, imagine being able to, you know, rent access to Coachella. If I have an if I have the NFT to Coachella and I can't go because I'm sick or something, I can rent that to you for 0.3 Ethereum, you know, and that would be that would be better for me because I'm able to get yeah, yeah. someone's able to get a good access to it. So this middle letter, it really helps prevent the thievery, or you know, so-called replacing the blockbuster DVD that can often that is potential with you know actually giving the NFT to someone else to rent. So a smart contract to, through token proof states who has access to the NFT, and it can't be done with any trading because it has the consistently moving QR code. So the next steps for us is to begin working with the token group team to fully develop a sister app for the marketplace. This would look similar to how Facebook and Messenger are both able to work on the same platform together, but are both to have different uses. So we want to also begin a marketing program in the future, focusing on utility and regional aspects, mainly bringing focus to Northwest Arkansas, as that's what we want to be based in. And then we also want to find other segments that can be utilizing the NFT rentals. So we showcased a few that are currently available and some that we can kind of see in the future. But we want to kind of work with some local stuff, like uh, speakeasies and whatnot, to where, you know, where I might not have access to, uh, I think it's Bob's apartment. I've never been, unfortunately, in Fayetteville because I'm not cool enough. But, you know, if I were cool enough, I'd be able to rent one instead and be able to get access into it. So those are our next steps. And then that's all we got. questions? So um, have you guys looked at the, I guess the legality part of it in terms of how these other uh, companies might feel about renting? So I think it, so I think it would just depend on the company. Obviously, you know, it'd be kind of the whole idea of an NFT being rented is, you know, if you hold the NFT, then you're, you have access to it. So I think I think it would just depend on the company. If it were something like Builder and they said, like, we don't we don't want to allow this, so I think the NFT would be kind of more in a more stable position. And yeah. I think it mainly just depends on the utility of you know how they want that um, yeah. how they want the NFT to give you access. Thanks. Absolutely. So what would what would be your um, plan to market to like season ticket holders mm -hmm. for Razorback games? So first thing would be to actually communicate with the Razorbacks and mm -hmm. to actually say, hey, let's do NFTs. And the reason for that is because we can generate revenue because whenever each and every time this is sold, you get you know a small chunk of that, whether they said to 3% or 10%. So every single time someone says, hey, you know, I don't need this anymore. You know, I'm, in a, I'm an old student, so I can just sell this. Mm -hmm. 
and you know someone's like I like the art on this or maybe it's Crystal Bridges you know and they want to have that for a little bit mm -hmm. I think the main access from that comes from you know a lot of you hold student passes and you can't attend every game we see that if you in group meetings it's seen right. all the time where someone will sell their group will where someone will sell their little tickets and so that's able to help out with a lot of that help the university get a little bit of extra money as a result of that and then also for the students to get a little extra money from that as well. So how would you split that out? It just depends on what the university would want, and mm -hmm. so from the gas fees and whatnot, and that's, mm -hmm. how we would, that's how we would send what. And what about the end user, the end, like the actual ticket holder? So, so The yeah. season ticket holder. So they would just be able to get however much they, they request for that, and mm -hmm. I think from market pricing would, end up, would be ending up sorting it out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mason. Thank you. I forgot to use the microphone, so nobody heard you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, by the way, universities only ask for 10% of all of your earnings the rest of your life. And it's, we try to keep it very simple. We call it tithing. It's the right thing to do. Um, all right, Veritas, verified annual. Um, uh, Judges also, if you would hand the microphone, because the streaming people of the world want to want to hear better, I've been told. So, Danny, I'll give you this. Quick question before we start. Uh, do you need us to point, or do you have the script that you for? Point? OK. This is footage from the Russia-Ukraine. This is footage that many of us have seen regarding the Russia-Ukraine war. It depicts two fighter jets, one of which being shot down by the legendary pilot, the Ghost of Kiev. And guess what? It's fake. This is actually a video game. This is the power of fake news. We are Team Veritas Verify. With our blockchain-based solution to restore trust in the media, Veritas News. In recent elections, misinformation has undermined the democratic process. Thousands of news stories have flooded the internet and, set, and spread like wildfire. This has led to a massive decrease in the public trust in the news. To address these problems, we created a decentralized application that allows for the crowdsourcing and monetization of verified news. Uh, our app is governed by Alethea Dow. We built our app on Polygon to avoid Ethereum's high gas fees and while at the same time giving us a rich and vast community that we can also back off of. Um, we created a utility token, Dharma, to fuel inter 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 interaction on the application. Veritas News contains three main components, the Marketplace, Alethea Dow, and uh, Veritas News. This is Bob and Alice. They will play the roles of our users and validators today. Bob is a citizen at a local school board meeting during an election cycle. Bob has uploaded a video, Bob has recorded a video of the meeting and would like to share it. He will upload the video to the Veritas News app and submit a microtransaction with Dharma. The video will then run through our algorithm, which will determine the probability of truth via certain mechanisms. Once the probability of truth reaches a certain threshold, the video is then minted as an NFT and Bob's microtransaction is returned. The hash of the metadata of the NFT will be stored on the Arweave blockchain for permanent storage. 
Once the NFT is listed on our marketplace, it will be sold to news organizations. If the NFT is sold, Bob will receive a portion of the sales, and the rest will go to the Dow Treasury. However, if the video that Bob uploads does not meet a certain truth probability threshold, he will forfeit his microtransaction and the NFT will not be minted. This is when the algorithm turns out an incorrect story or enough members of the community vote that the story is false, our validation mechanism is activated. This is where Alice comes into the picture. Alice is a verifying node. She is an accredited journalist who has been KYC verified and elected by holders of Aletheia. In order for her to become a node, she must submit a stake of Aletheia. Once the governance mechanism is activated, Alice will manually review the information presented to determine the probability of truth with other nodes. If the other nodes agree with her decision, she will be rewarded with Dharma and the information will be minted as an NFT. If the other wards do not agree, the other nodes do not agree with her decision, she will not be rewarded with Dharma. However, if she acts acts maliciously or in contrast to the principles of the network, she will forfeit her stake of Aletheia. The Veritas, News the Veritas News app will help fund the Aletheia DAO via advertisements on the app's news feed, paid for in Dharma. All transaction fees on the Dharma network will be stored in the Aletheia DAO treasury for future reward disbursements. When providers sign up for the app they and connect their wallet, they will then be airdropped a small amount of Dharma so that they can submit stories. To submit a story, they must first link their wallet, then upload their file. They will then submit a small microtransaction in order to post the story. When providers submit their story, they are rated on, based on a karma system. If the story is minted, their karma will increase and the cost to submit more stories will decrease. If the story is not minted, their karma will decrease and it will become progressively more expensive to submit stories. This is done to disincentivize bad actors from spamming the app with fake stories. So our platform has multiple revenue streams and this is to ensure the longevity and growth of our network. Um, our DAO is funded through advertising fees, transaction fees from the minting and sale of NFTs, as well as penalty fees from revoked microtransactions. Uh, in terms of costs on-chain, uh, community airdrops have an inflationary effect on supply and they can lower the uh, price of our Dharma token if demand does not exceed supply. Um, also, because we store our data on Arweave, uh, this cost needs to be paid via the bundler network. And we also pay for Polygon gas fees through the DAO treasury. This is to optimize the user experience so that they only need to hold Dharma in their wallet and not Matic in conjunction. Uh, Off-chain, we have the cost of development and maintenance associated with our application and as well as a cost of capital um, or basically the investor's expected return. There is a huge market size of almost a billion and a half dollars. The adult population in the United States is around 258.3 million. Uh, the majority of the adults, they get their news on a mobile device and also lack trust in mainstream media. Um, by extrapolating the uh, number of people who buy media and also um, buy media and also uh, um, anyways, we would predict our market size to be around 1.5 billion dollars. Um, our future roadmap is made up of three phases. Phase one. Uh, includes fine-tuning and refining tokenomic structures as well as testing the algorithm and releasing our white paper to the public. And then phase two solves the uh, formation of Veritas Lab, which will raise capital and acquire talent. Uh, during this time frame, we plan to raise capital and acquire ta talent to begin development of our occupation. And then phase three, we also will launch a beta news app and also uh, launch our uh, Veritas Academy, uh, which will, con uh, will continue to scale across the internet. And if you want to reach us, 
you can use our QR code here. If you guys have questions, we'd love to answer them. Okay, great. Um, what is your estimated timeline from the when the algorithm adjudicates the news story and mints it NFT to blockchain between when the story broke? So when the story breaks, um, it, how the algorithm would work is it would take multiple reports of the same event and image uh, for it to be re released as an NFT, it mm -hmm. will be based off multiple reports. And so once a certain number of reports, we don't have that figured out yet, but once a certain number of reports have been released of that event, it will be then minted as an NFT. Okay. And have you looked at building in any type of royalty fee to the actual editor of the article? Yes, um, that would be part of the NFT transaction fees will be rewarded to the submitter of the information. Okay. Is there any type of payment mechanism with that NFT? Should somebody sell it on a secondary market? There is not at the moment, but that is something that we would be exploring in our future roadmap. Okay. And have you looked at any integration with any other wallets other than MetaMask? Yes, we have. That is part of our planned roadmap. Um, we plan to integrate with several different wallets, and especially with mobile wallets. Okay. And what is your barrier to entry for, how are you going to overcome the current barrier to entry for Web3 dApps? Well, at the moment, I think we have a unique value proposition. Um, there are other competitors like Anza, they use Anza Check, mm -hmm. and that is a blockchain. Uh, basically, how that works is it says, it tells you that their stories are written by them, but it doesn't have the crowdsource mechanism that we have. It doesn't have the decentralized governance mechanism that I think really distinguishes um, our product. So, as far as barrier to entries, I do like to think that we do kind of have a first mover advantage and that we really want to capitalize on that. In user barrier of entry. Gotcha. Well, that, that would be I hard. Have, I should have stated that. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. I gotcha. Well, also in the roadmap, we do definitely need to implement a marketing plan to get the word out about our project and onboard people. Okay. That is part of the uh, Veritas Academy with our community development initiative. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hey, have you guys, did you guys do any prototyping? Any level of prototyping on this? Uh, what was that? Prototyping. Any, any level? Yeah. Just. Uh, uh, we had a mock-up of the screen, but we don't have the prototype yet. We have You're working that. on Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. No Thank you. Maybe you can imagine getting out of journalism school, working hard, getting through, putting yourself sometimes in uh, challenging uh, physical locations, working hard, redoing your stuff, and then having the world say, well, I don't trust the news. I mean, that's got to be kind of heartbreaking. So I, th I think it is an important uh, topic. Um, but I'm not supposed to editorialize, so I, we should get going. Um, the next one, um, restoring trust in political elections. Um, I, I know my MBA students asked me if I trusted the election. I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I believe Dwight Eisenhower was elected president in 56 or something, but uh, after that, it's a little bit fuzzy uh, what's going to happen. Um, are the crypto crusaders here? Come, come on up. Hey guys, uh, we are here uh, to present our product, the AIT Vote Chain, um, for our chosen use case. AIT stands for um, Accuracy, Integrity, and Transparency. Uh, this is our team. I'm Brandon. Driss. I'm Wyatt. Dalida. Um, our other team member couldn't make it today. Um, our problem statement use case was presented by BeChangeify. Um, it was how could we restore faith in our uh, current voting system? Scheduling issues is a problem in our voting system. Pew Research Center shows that 23% of Americans find voting difficult due to logistical issues such as waiting in line, 
taking off work or finding venues that they can vote at. Another issue with the current voting system is transparency. The current process does not support a real-time update of vote counts as it can take up to 30 minutes for votes to be processed at the state level. And the system that we designed will allow us to see the vote count almost instantaneously as well as provide an easy way for voters to turn out. And we have the lack of uh, confidentiality where uh, studies were shows, uh, showed that uh, by uh, Garlip, uh, six over 10 uh, Americans don't uh, have a faith on the election. And uh, especially what happened uh, with uh, the 2020 election, we were having like uh, the uh, there was news that says a uh, vote fraud was happening, and uh, and we have the have too many complicated uh, uh, process. Uh, for example, uh, there is the ballot uh, account. Then uh, after you count, count the ballot, the ballot uh, scanning. Then you go to a uh, uh, ballot uh, tablet. Then the tabulation transferation with the VUSB. Uh, then after you receive your VSB transfer to the election board to be counted, then they will uh, post it on the state uh, website. Um, currently, we are. Um, this is the registration phase. We are currently offering, or our, our plan is to currently offer two types of registrations. You can do the traditional registration, which is in person. Arkansas doesn't actually offer an online registration method, so that's our plan: is to kind of supplant the current uh, registration method with our our system. Uh, in person, you would go to your local registration office. I think normally it's the DMV. Um, they would do an in-person verification, which you would receive a registration card, which you would then take to an online are on our system online, create your account. It would ask you if you'd already registered. You enter that registration code, uh, followed by your social security number um, and a password, and you'd create your online account. Online registration, be very simple. Create an online account. You'd submit something very similar to an I-9 form to verify uh, your citizenship. Uh, then wait about two to three days for that verification to come through, and you would also be registered to vote on the, on the blockchain. Here we go. Uh, this is going to be the web version. So we've got a desktop version. It should be able to play. Yeah. So this is the desktop version of the uh, application that we have. This is currently deployed onto a web server right now. You can go in, you'll connect your wallet, you'll submit your vote, and then it should update. It does take a little bit for it to go because it is on Ethereum right now. Uh, once this video completes, though, you'll see the mobile version that we have mocked up for it. Uh, for this, the voter can have these two options. This is the online version that they can have, or they can actually go into an election office, go to a kiosk, and this would just be displayed on the desktop version for them to go through and access. And then if they did need help for the access accessibility, they would be able to ask somebody for help if they actually needed it. Uh, it just depends on what they would need accommodations for. And here is the mobile version of our mock-up that we have. Um, so we believe that we've come up with a system that would um, uh, be accessible, trusted, um, and secured that would report real-time uh, voting data for the general public that would help restore uh, confidence in, in, the, in the election system. Um, as you can see here, we have, do have NFT. We feel like that's, uh, we can mint an NFT very similar to how you get I, have, I voted sticker. Uh, as a way of redundancy to you can count the number of votes and see how many uh, NFTs were minted is more of a uh, backup plan, so. And this right here is our working timeline. Uh, quarter one of this year, we ex expect to expand the application. This is where we're gonna hi start hiring a few more developers as well as uh, blockchain developers that can actually build up our blockchain. Uh, we're wanting to do our own blockchain for this project. That way we're not we're not working on other different blockchains, having them possibly do things to it, but it will be more like the Ethereum where you can actually run contracts 
quarter three, we're going to start integrating external wallets. So our coin will be able to go to your personal wallet wherever you may hold it. If you want to hold it offline, you can have your voting token that you will have. This is also where your NFT will be stored once the vote's been processed. Uh, quarter four, we're going to start beta testing. This will be for companies. Uh, so we see companies using this maybe for board meetings, voting on stuff for their board meetings, as well as if a company wants to have a fun day and they just want to vote, hey, what are we going to do for this fun day for the company? You can vote there. This is where delegation will be implemented. This will not be implemented on a state level, but for the more production level for companies, you'll see the delegation process where you can actually delegate your vote to somebody else within your department. Uh, year two, we're going to start hiring a, a full team, and this is where we'll really bring in everything to start actually pushing out the full launch of our application. And next. And if you guys need to contact us, this is all of our contact information. I do have the code posted GitHub if you want to check it out. Uh, and there is a production server, but it is currently turned off. Any questions? So you say that you're going to create your own blockchain. Part of, you know, the blockchain ecosystem is open source. Are you going to make your code open source? Our code will be open source. And it'll be branched off of most likely Ethereum so that we have the contract integration. Okay. So do you plan to automate the NFT minting process and deliver at deliver that directly to the end user's wallet? Yes, that will be, so the function for voting will commit the vote, and then it will also mint the NFT and send that back to the user's address, as well as the details of their vote will be in an encrypted message mm -hmm. or a memo that will be sent back to them as kind of a receipt, so that they, people can go and look at their, what, who they voted for, but people at the end of the blockchain, if you're accessing it to see if that person voted, they will not be able to see that. So you're not going to minute to the met metadata in the smart contract? No. The metadata will go back to the user separately. Okay. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the um, issues with voter registration and, and individuals voting is they don't, they don't necessarily want other people to know that they're voting or who they're voting for. So through your process, how are you going to keep that privacy intact, or are you? The privacy for the if the person has voted will not be. Uh, that is part of the transparency project that we have. Okay. So we want it to be transparent so everybody knows that people can vote, and you can access and see if people have voted and whether they're a citizen or not. Um, do you want to expand upon that? Um, I think I think I understand your question. Um, I think for for this application, um, it's not it's we we, we want to be able to make a blockchain where you can see that the person has voted, but not necessarily who they voted for. We want to keep that completely secure, right? But we want to provide real time data that this person has voted. Keep their information as far as who they voted for private. So. so do you plan to use a public permissionless blockchain? It, I think we, our, our idea uh, originally was a public permissioned blockchain where we'd have uh, selected validators um, for that. So it wouldn't be permissionless. Not everyone can run a validator node. Okay. Is part of your goal to be able to vote anywhere? Correct. Yeah. So, um, on the on the slide where we were discussing some of the logistical issues, mm -hmm. some of the problems is people just can't find a venue near them, um, or they they just can't take off of work. So it would be nice if they could just open up their phone and be able to vote. Even and it would be a applicable for any of the Americans that aren't in the United States as well. So so they'd be able to vote even if they're out of country. And so when they went to the spot to actually vote, because they still want that experience, there would then be another device there in front of them. They wouldn't vote from their phone. They would vote with the device that's provided to them, and it would replace the paper ballots altogether? Correct. So it, the goal is to supplant the current voting system. So we want to make it accessible, because we know not everyone's going to be able to, uh, um, you know, handle their own wallet keys. And I think uh, our original plan is to have it default as a custodial wallet, where uh, it's handled by either the, the, the state, at the state level, uh, where they can um, 
they they manage the keys so that way if they forget their password or something that we can always recover that for them so thank you Thanks. Thank you. I hope you guys were able to engage with uh, Marlene on this. She uh, audited the U.S. selection software, so she's uh, fairly familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of the system until the Chinese bought the IP and we can't audit our election stuff anymore because <laughs> we don't seem to own it. It's very strange. Um, but anyway, yeah, important topic. And uh, um, But again, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Did I mention 10% hog tithing? I, I've already talked about that. Okay. All right, uh, NFTs for real world art by Bloom's Art House Collective. Team, go hogs. By the way, Marlene couldn't make it tonight. She and her, her husband's Fulbert uh, Air Force is a little occupied right now, but uh, uh, they did just buy land in Arkansas, so their dogs will have room to run. How's it going? Uh, my name's Graham Stevens. I'm Charlie. Um, we're Team Go Hogs, and we are the uh, Art Ventures Northwest Arkansas NFT project use case. So, Art Ventures is a nonprofit charitable charitable organization that's actually located on Hill Avenue, right down the street uh, by Atmosphere. They focus on educating kids uh, or everybody in the Northwest Arkansas area about art and giving them opportunity. Yeah, so they, uh, like you said, they're located closed. They're free to the public, and they really work to empower the youth to kind of continue on art. Uh, they also provide uh, different art galleries that represent the community well. Uh, they currently have one going uh, that empowers kind of, uh, it's representing kind of woman empowerment and the achievements of women. Um, so that's what kind of they've been up to lately. So some of the artists here are local Northwest Arkansas residents. Uh, Carol Hart has established the Blair Art Center. Um, she's also founded a nonprofit organization uh, called Lifestyle. She's got work in galleries in Scottsdale, Arizona, Fayetteville, and then in Little Rock, and then Art Maripol. He's a local photographer who has work in Art Ventures Gallery right now. Um, it's the 1974 uh, Fayetteville Farmer's Market, just some pictures from there. And then so artists currently get paid through um, just buying artist pieces uh, at the galleries. They get donations through uh, people who go to the galleries and like their paintings. Um, but a lot of those paintings are expensive. So we're thinking of ways to get artists paid. Um, and we're thinking NFTs and digital art is a good way to get artists paid. And they can retain ownership of their art and still make money off of it while if uh, somebody likes the art, they can buy it and not have to spend $500 and still support the artist. Uh, as many of y'all know, an NFT, non-fungible token, uh, backed by the Ethereum blockchain, um, with popular ones lately being stuff like uh, NBA Top Shot, uh, Board AP Yacht Club, and uh, World of Women Galaxy, which have gained a lot of recognition in the past few years. So making NFTs has uh, become a lot easier these days. Um, it used to cost, I think, around $100 to mint an NFT, but today you can go on marketplaces such as OpenSea. Um, Rarible is a great example as well, where you can buy, sell, and create your own NFTs. Um, if you want to click on that link, here, there's an example of an NFT that we've created. Um, so you can see here uh, on the NFT, if you're looking at it, um, you can see the creator of it. You can see the percentage of royalties. So anytime there's a secondary or tertiary sale of somebody who's bought it, that uh, original creator will still get a kickback of money from that. You can see the bids that are on it. You can see the history of who's owned it and who's minted it. Um, and you can add it to a collection too, which is like, it's a lot, it's like communities that are already established on Rarible. So there's art communities that you could put your own art into to get um, your word out other than just in Northwest Arkansas. And so we have a little demonstration of kind of what we want to see from it. Um, so this is our friend, Max. Uh, Max loves Northwest Arkansas art. He loves getting to go to different galleries. Um, he loves many different artists from the Northwest Arkansas region. 
uh, and he loves trying to support them, but that's not always easy when you don't have $600 in your account. So uh, what we're proposing is to add a QR code to the pre-existent art descriptions. That way, Max, when he wants to come and support the, his favorite artist, he can just pull out his tablet, scan the QR code, and then, oh, not yet, bam. He gets pulled up to the page where he can purchase the NFT um, for his favorite artist. So if you all want to pull out your phone, this will take you actually to our NFT on Rarible. Um, it's, Is it for sale? Uh, if you want to buy it, go ahead and buy it, yeah. <laughs> so uh, each piece um, in the art gallery, whether it's a painting, we can have the QR code listed um, on the frame with the description of the painting um, and who's buying it. And then if it's like a sculpture or something along those lines, you can have it just on the plaque. Um, it's an easy way. Um, we've talked to Art Ventures. They said they already kind of have some QR codes. Uh, and so there'd just be an easy way to implement them um, into Art Ventures. And um, we, can, we can put it in their web page like this. It's already embedded. They have an online sales section that you can see that obviously, if you want to buy this painting, it's $800. But let's say, like, I love this painting, so I want to go buy it. You have a QR code that's embedded in the already existent um, sales section on the Northwest Arkansas website, and it'll just take you to Rarible, and you can purchase the NFT from there. We wanted to make sure there's ease of access when um, creating or buying an NFT. So for artists, all you really have to do is you set up your MetaMask account, or um, uh, Rarible also supports other blockchains. There's the Flow blockchain that you could use. Um, you set that a account up, and it's with your Google Chrome extension. You use the 12-word uh, password that only you can keep. Like only you should know it to access your account. And then once you have set that up, it links automatically to your Rarible account. And from there, all you do is just insert your GIF or your JPEG file or your MP3 file and list the price. It'll give you options to obviously, like I was showing you, to give you can get a kickback from your other sales if somebody buys it and then they sell it. And then for buyers, all you would do is scan the QR code, set up the mobile app on your phone the same way an artist would, and all you have to do is link your Visa card and you purchase it. It's, um, you purchase it with Ethereum, but if you set up your Visa card, it'll just take out the allotted amount. That So if it's like, for, for example, ours is, is 0.1 Ethereum, it'd be like $323 that would be charged to your Visa card. It automatically converts it for you. The, um, there are benefits of NFTs and art. Um, artists get to retain control of their art. That's one of the biggest problems that our, um, Art Ventures was having. Uh, they say they normally give out art to other galleries on like a flash drive and nothing stopping them from being able to, or nothing stopping the other gallery from being able to take that art and call it their own. Um, we've proposed that artists make their own NFTs. That's a good way that we can lend out art to galleries. Um, NFTs also allow for a greater community reach than just your local art gallery. Let's say somebody likes the art, they take it back to, like, let's say New York, and they can see, oh, that's a cool NFT. Where'd you get it from? Oh, Art Ventures in Arkansas. Maybe they like the piece and want it to add it to their gallery, so they buy it. It's just a good way to reach people outside of our local area. And finally, when we contacted Art Ventures uh, on top of empowering their artists, uh, they had a problem with uh, photo security. Uh, people or galleries just screenshotting their art and kind of using it as their own. So super simple idea, but uh, we had the proposition of just adding watermarks to the NFTs and different digital art. Awesome. Thank y'all. Thank you. Does this allow the artist, as you said, like to lend it out, but lend it out for free, basically? Y yes, ma'am. So, so um, our idea, I guess, um, they're having artists were having trouble just kind of getting more exposure um, with art ventures. So what we wanted to do was, it's super easy. Each artist can make their own account, and obviously, um, if they want to share a percentage of their earnings with art ventures, they could because they're giving them recognition as well. But I think the main thing was that the, like the, it was just easy for an artist to be able to go and create their own NFTs, and they can be able to 
send them to different galleries, um, and that may, if that gallery wants to pay them for it, they can as well. So it's it, it, it just depends because Art Ventures helps people put their art in their galleries. I'm not sure if they pay for it as well, but it's just a um, an idea to get artists the compensation they deserve. So most artists are creative people and mm -hmm. not um, don't have a lot of technical skills. Yeah, that's that's kind of why um, that's what I was saying with the ease of access. It's mm -hmm. um, if you've ever added like the Honey browser extension to your uh, Chrome browser, it's literally all you have to do is click MetaMask and then just enter in 12 words that they give you. You just have to drag in into the right order. Making the MetaMask wallet is probably the hardest part because all you're doing other than that is just uploading a JPEG into a like a uh, like it makes the and mints the NFT for you. So that process, you insert the JPEG and then you insert how much you want it to cost and the royalty and um, Rarible takes like a set 2.5% uh, sales fee out of everything. Mm -hmm. So like that's the only sales fee that you're paying. You get, I, I guess, 75.5% of the money that you're getting. So it's super like beneficial to artists because they're getting most of the money they uh, make off the NFTs. and. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good job. A friend of mine used to run the uh, the AT and T um, asynchronous transfer mode backbone. Super smart gal, um, and she decided she missed art too much, and she quit her job. And she's in Shanghai back home and makes art and drawings. I have some in my office, and uh, she recently minted her art and made it available on on uh, OpenSea or Rarible. And uh, and so I told her I'd buy some and put it in the metaverse in my house to be in Decentraland some of her art could be on the wall of my metaverse house. And she says, the networks are so poor, <laughs> she may go back out of art and back into the networks to fix them so that the metaverse experience of seeing art would be, a, would be a, to her, a higher quality experience. Um, OK, um, Tara Hash, we actually had one drop out at the end, so we're, we're OK with, uh, with the timing. Um, we will, um, this will be the last one before we take a Let's see, it looks like a 10 minute break. So, um, Tara Hash, you are gonna talk about the Metaverse, which was my official bridge for you. Metaverse Audit and Decentraland by Qlytics. Hi, my name's Jacob and our team is Tara Hash. Uh, Hello, uh, my name is Philip. Um, and then Maddie is sitting over there. She has a uh, ear infection and has a sore throat, so she can't talk right now. So, so yeah, our mission with TerraHash is to have, um, <coughs> yeah. So our mission with TerraHash is to basically help condense the information of land of Decentraland's land tokens to be readable and uh, moderate it for anomalous behavior in Decentraland. So the problem, uh, <coughs> in the ever-growing world of the metaverse, there are tracking anomalous behavior is very hard because they're <coughs> So there isn't an easy way to monitor uh, tracking for unusual or anomalous activity. Uh, a, ver <coughs> a good example is in Decentraland, which is a virtual world where you can buy land tokens to, uh, <coughs> to buy big parcels of land in the metaverse. And JP Morgan has bought $2 million of land in Decentraland, and you want that <coughs> you want that investment to be safe. And right now, there isn't a good way to do that. Uh, yeah. right. Our solution is like other data um, aggregation sites, like um, 
Zillow, and Baseball Reference. We're going to make a site that aggregates um, the, the Central Lands APIs, uh, Lands Smart Contract, Smart Contract uh, API uh, that records how much a key holder uh, holds in. <coughs> how much a smart how much a land oh go back <laughs> yeah land holds in we can take all that information and aggregate it and then be able to make uh, graphs and charts that will show these some anomalous behavior and then we can uh, put it up to a vote in the central lands DAO to help uh, alleviate some of those problems. So. so some unique features is that we would have a unique algorithm to um, parse that data from all the available public land, um, land token keys that are available with those smart contracts. And then we'll have a easy to use interface like uh, <clears throat> like Zillow, like uh, baseball reference, you know, be able to see big, large sets of data condensed into a readable form. Yeah. Uh, now coming through the competition, um, we looked at the market and there are some auditing services for blockchains, but no one has a customized uh, unique solution that is specialized and focused on Decentraland. Um, and the tracks uh, anomalous behavior um, exactly so we would offer that and have a new solution for the market yes uh, coming to the financials um, the way we plan to make money is on a sub subscription based system um, also we want to allow new customers to have a month of free trial um, that allows them to see if uh, our solution fits their needs um, and yeah is, is a good product <laughs> um, the value to customers is uh, quite easy um, our solution um, our solutions value is being able to warn parcel owners um, on unusual behavior um, that could harm them or the whole system and to make decentral land a safe place um, it also our solution also allows um, for individual customize, customization of the system, um, and it's a very easy to use interface. Um, yes. Yes, this is our team, um, and thank you for listening. We're happy to answer the following questions. Will your UX be um, Web3 based? Um, initially, initially, it would be like Web2, like Zillow, like mm -hmm. be more like internet browser based. But in the future, we would go into Web3. OK, thank you. Thanks. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> So there's obviously a lot of interest any time. I think uh, Decentraland, either October of last year, had $40 billion exchanged in one month. Um, so there's uh, law enforcement people that are very curious to see who's uh, doing what. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating space. As an Ethereum contract, there are patterns for memory and how to extract things. And there's actually one... Uh, one side, if anybody's interested in, in downloading some of the data history of, of uh, any Ethereum contract, there's a nice site on GitHub if you have some uh, Python understanding, I can uh, point you in that direction. But as you might guess, law enforcement is very interested, especially as we start to get into a U.S. SWIFT system versus an alternative money uh, system of the world. The people want to send their resources <laughs> from one to the other. And my guess and the guests of the FBI and so on is that uh, they will do this through um, 
monetization uh, mechanisms of Web3 and Metaverse stuff. In other words, money laundering across uh, um, you know, $40 billion is being exchanged and we don't have any audit tools available right now. That's, uh, that, that's um, an opportunity, right? And uh, if you do that well and give 10% back to the university, uh, well, I've already mentioned that. Um, all right, so we're supposed to take a 15-minute, well, a break. Um, come, they said come back at uh, 6.30, so I'm supposed to tell the students to be back at 6.20 because they do N plus 10. Um, but officially at uh, 6.30, we'll come back, and then we've got uh, one, two, three more cases, I believe is all we've, we've got after break. But take 15, and, and please uh, uh, interact with the judges, and uh, um, thanks. Pause. So, when, when I was at uh, Notre Dame, we had Warren Buffett come visit and talk to the class. He says, testing 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion. <laughs> if I hadn't sold all my Bitcoin at $13, <laughs> I'd be able to do that too. But testing 10 cents, 11 cents. Poor Professor Dan. Okay, so I think we have, uh, we have three left. Um, one of them is... Um, uh, not not going to be able to speak tonight. So I think we're at uh, the order of events will be non-fungible teams will be next, then CHURG, C-H-R-G, and then uh, Bite Hogs. Was anybody else hoping to present? We're missing a judge. Oh, Serenance. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll stall. Testing, one billion. <laughs> um, if you get a chance, I know these things are going to be recorded and, and put on the uh, the YouTube channel. So um, I I look forward to seeing some of these. I've worked with um, teams that are presenting in other rooms, and I'd very much like to kind of see some of the things that are going on. Um, let's see. I I we have to have Strans here. So let me um, I'll put this down and go see if we can track him down. He might be looking. Uh, he, he was off buying land in Decentraland. <laughs> Actually, I have a friend who um, supplies blockchain uh, data to the Chicago Board of Exchange. And um, he, um, uh, his company, just two of them, just bought an office space in Decentraland for $15,000. Um, that's real money going in. I mean, he's a company of two, two people that are, you know, technically pretty good. And you know they, they provide data, they screen scrape, they've got a lot of data feeds just like a, a chain analysis. Um, but yeah, paid $15,000 for office space in Decentraland. There, there's something going on, right? As they said in the 60s song, what it is ain't it exactly clear. <laughs> but there's something going on around here. Um, anyway, I didn't mock him. Uh, 10 years ago, I would have mocked something like that. Now I just admit I don't understand it, but I've stopped mocking people who end up doing a lot better than I do. Um, all right, so I think we've got non-fungible team. Is that possible? Is, is our next uh, next group? There's more of them than me, so I'll hand over the microphone. Reduce theft in supply chain with IoT tracking by mycelium networks. Uh, so we are the so uh, we are the non-fungible team, and our use case is reducing reducing theft in supply chains uh, using the Helium network. Uh, just one more click. Okay, so uh, the Helium network uh, can be used to track assets along the supply chain. Compared to previous solutions, it is very affordable and it is more efficient in terms of power consumption. Uh, and it utilizes the Low Rowan protocol, uh, LongFi radio technology, 
So it's a long range, wide area network. And currently there are over 600,000 helium hotspots located all across the globe. So not only are we uh, helium enthusiasts, but we're also actors. So we got a little video for y'all here. Okay, so here we go. We're picking up, uh, we're putting the tracker into the storage uh, with all the items that we have in there. And we're gonna be moving it over to a uh, vehicle and let me see here. Yeah, you can turn the music down a little bit too. It's yeah. the car's heading off. And you can see that the, we are tracking the car here, and each of those little green dots are different nodes and uh, the tracker is activated in the car and it uh, goes over to the nodes and those blue nodes that we have show that they have been activated from that. So there we are, we're stopping the car, it's uh, taking a break and um, the items are left there just for like a little break or whatever and someone comes in here, Got another person coming in. and I happened to leave my car unlocked. So he's coming in and taking it away. <clears throat> so basically, uh, on the back on the map, once we get there, you'll see the, the green nodes are the nodes that are, or the hotspots that are synced. And it doesn't actually connect to each node or hotspot as it drives by. It's just kind of an example of the ones that are within the range of the device. And so the device that we actually have is just a GPS device like any other like a tile or an air tag and so for example it's using the hotspots like an air tag would use iPhones to geolocate where the device is and so you can see the green one the red ones are offline the green ones are online we're able to see where it goes that using that and then we found the uh, the asset and bringing it back to us <laughs> But basically, it makes it to where you can use the helium network to track your assets. If you want to go on my next. Yeah. yeah, so basically the problem that we noticed is that theft in supply chains has increased in recent years. Um, that video is just a smaller example of just, you know, two guys. But um, in large scale supply chains, theft has increased in recent years. And there are other solutions that exist, but they're very costly and not as reliable. Um, so basically we offer a solution for asset tracking through connection to the Helium network using LongFi radio technology. Um, and basically our solution is cost efficient um, and it is much more reliable than any other um, solutions. And <clears throat> some of the solutions that are going that they're using right now um, could be possible like Wi-Fi within buildings. You can track assets doing it that way. Um, what most companies are using is LTE in cellular data to actually track their assets along the supply chain and that's just costly because it's a licensed uh, technology and they have to pay the companies that have the towers to actually be able to get the information for their assets. Uh, and like you said earlier there's six, over 600,000 hotspots online right now um, in the world and that's a growing every day. And what I like about Helium is, like I said, on the other solutions that they're using, they're more um, like company-based, so you have to pay subscriptions to be able to use the software. But in the Helium network, it's a people's network, so people are buying hotspots and um, joining the network in their own homes. So if you were to have a hotspot that you own destroyed, well then, it automatically starts backing up to the network and keeping tracking your devices just with other people's hotspots. Um, there's a lot of different things you can track in the using these sensors. You can do anything from temperature, humidity, direction, uh, speed. I mean, you could get soil samples. You can go anywhere, um, agricultural to logistical. It doesn't really matter. And electronic electricity costs are very low for these hotspots as well as the sensors, the battery lives will last a lot longer, up to decades, um, depending on the battery you put in it. 
and um, the long fly technology is kind of like Wi-Fi, but it just is a lot longer range and lower frequency, so that they'll be able to um, track that lower, um, easier data to collect. Uh, this is our team. If you ever want to know who we are, and then. Uh, as we said earlier, the item we used for our, pres our demonstration was the most basic type of thing, just like GPS. But the cool thing about helium is it can be used in plenty of markets. And some markets that we identified were microgreens or vertical farming. For traditional farming, it'd be a bit harder to utilize a whole blockchain for that much logistics to go through. And another one would be healthcare, not only just I. Uh, reviewing the patient data, but also making sure that vaccines get to and from places they need to go and uh, make sure that they are under the right treatment. And as we said as well, the large scale logistics can be combined with RFID chips to make sure it's all asset tracked. Um, the way that blockchain is used in this instance, it was at the transaction level where um, actual Internet of Things devices such as those sensors are sending information through the hotspots and so the transactions are then recorded on the Helium blockchain so that you can go back and see um, what data was moved and when and from where and the actual packets are located within the, the devices themselves. Yeah. We're open to questions. <coughs> We have a minute, minute in between. Um, yeah, helium's really interesting. I had a, a friend a year ago told me I need to look into helium. He's a, one of the Cisco Systems fellows, which they've only had four, so a high achieving sort of networking guy, runs the Olympic networks for NBC. And uh, he said, you need to look into the, the helium network. And I'm like, I'm too old to learn anything new. <laughs> There's so much stuff, you know, and, and uh, but uh, it, it, it does look uh, like a very interesting, um, I have a node set up in my house. I mean, I, 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 I'm surprised I'm not charged with commercial, with the amount of stuff I have at my house. Uh, but but helium's a, a pretty neat thing, and um, I know it's very active. We're one of the most dense areas in uh, helium nodes in America, so that's. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that as we go on. Um, but anyway, yeah, he, a year ago he thought I should look into that. He's doing quantum resistant blockchain design right now, so he's a super high achieving guy. But uh, he, what he's built in his more recent protocols, a LISP, a location independent separation protocol, on top of a helium network is uh, of uh, high interest to people who are looking at both IoT and uh, a more equitable people's network. Um, Okay, so we've got uh, two groups left. Um, charge, C-H-R-G. Um, this is the case that sort of everybody wanted, so you guys must have clicked right away. <laughs> we are ready to go. <clears throat> Almost ready to go? Perfect, if you go back one more, perfect. Hey, audience, judges, we are Charge. Um, we are a decentralized EV charging protocol. Quick introduction to the team real quick. If you want to introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Nick, and I am a junior studying information systems here at the University of Arkansas. Hey, I'm Payne. I'm a junior studying economics. And my name is Michael. I am also a junior studying business management with a minor in blockchain technology. So the problem that we have seen um, in the EV protocol is that we know Arkansas is a leader in the transportation system and a leader in the logistics systems. And we also know that the world is moving towards electronic 
cars electric cars and and what we've seen is that there's about 200 charging stations over the country over the state of arkansas um, and there's a lack of incentive or a lack of adaption that people want to put charging nodes um, or charging stations across the country so what are what we are planning to do in our vision if you hit the next slide um, is have a distributed network of public use EV chargers. And so we're trying to incentivize the use of charging stations across Arkansas. And so um, we're trying to create a public permissionless system network of community of EV chargers, um, whether that's drivers, owners, hosts, and manufacturers. So how we do this is with our community that we are trying to build. And so our community consists of drivers, um, con consists of owners, hosts, and miners, and then um, just the, the network users who use the carbon credits that we'll talk about later. Um, and then we also have the charging nodes and the charging wallet. Um, the charging wallet is a, an app on your phone that will show the other chargers um, all around the area, allows you to pay, have a map, um, and everything else that Payne will talk about more. Yeah, and you can go next slide. So to break down um, our two main products, we first have uh, our charger. Um, the charger serves as um, a node in our sort of uh, network. Um, each charger is going to have the blockchain uh, running on it to really achieve the decentralization of our network. Um, the chargers will be solar and grid powered. Uh, payments will run through a QR code um, and ne near field communication. Uh, and then to explain a little bit more about our wallet. Uh, we'll have a digital identity feature to make sure users can anonymous, anonymously join our network. Um, the wallet will have a map of all of the charging stations, similar to the Helium map that was shown in the last presentation. Um, and another cool feature of our wallet is something we call mining mode, which is like a do not disturb like function um, that sort of disincentivizes drivers from being on their phones while driving by rewarding them tokens for being on our mining mode, do not disturb mode. You can go next slide. Yeah, so the worldwide EV charging market is booming. Um, you know, projected to grow over, uh, the whole infrastructure is projected to grow over 600% over the next five years. Um, the U.S. Department of Transportation and Energy has said they're going to allocate over $50 million to um, infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure, right here in Arkansas. So the market uh, is clearly there. We just want to make sure that we have infrastructure ready uh, to use it in Northwest Arkansas. Next slide. To touch a little bit on our competition, um, there is one project that kind of shares a thesis of using tokens and decentralization um, to encourage um, electric vehicle charger sharing. That project is called Electric Vehicle Direct Currency, or EVDC. Um, we have a couple really strong competitive advantages, in our opinion, to this project. And one is just uh, the actual decentralization of our project. EVDC, um, similar in us to a lot of ways, their chargers don't actually run blockchain. The blockchain and their project is run on one computer that's owned by the company, not really decentralized. Um, so through that decentralization, we have uh, the proof of stake, proof of stake network consensus, um, and the two token system, which Nick is going to talk about um, in a couple slides. Thank you, Pan. Um, so our in initial token distribution is going to be allocating 20% of our rewards to data sharing rewards. 5% of that initial token distribution will go to the team, as well as another 5% going to bounty incentives. So that's places where a charger is needed. There's a market for chargers, but there's no charger currently installed. 5% of that would go towards being able to allocate chargers into an area or a bountied region. Um, and then the other 70% of that pool is going to be our token distribution pool, of which 35% goes to owners, 30% goes to hosts, and 35% goes to miners based on the participation they're able to contribute on the network. Next slide. In terms of network dynamics, we have a two-token system consisting of our CHRG token as well as our CCT token. Um, these tokens are maintained by our burn mint equilibrium in that a, there is a, a 20 million supply of these coins at any given time. And for one to be created, another one of its inverse token must be burned. This ensures that the circulating supply stays at or below 20 million. Um, the nodes for our blockchain are run inside of the charging devices that we deploy. Uh, these nodes are solar powered, they run on single board computers, and they have a hashing algorithm for the blockchain that is designed to run on very low power, very eco-friendly hardware. And finally, our validators are located in the Charge Wallet app. 
uh, validators are able to validate CCT transactions, which are the transactions that are actually happening on chain, paying the devices themselves for your charge. And these transactions are, um, these transactions must be verified somehow. The way we do that is through a proof of stake system, through anyone participating in the ecosystem, being able to stake their CCT, as well as CHRG tokens in the app. Next slide. In terms of expenses and forecasting, we have a three-phase plan mapped out that will take overall between eight and 12 months to deploy, as well as some off-chain recurring costs um, and expenses down there at the bottom. And then that graph to the right shows the token price versus the users uh, utilizing that chain, daily active users. Any questions? Oh, actually, one more slide, I'm sorry. Any questions? You have any questions? What blockchain or technology are you planning on using? Uh, we had planned to deploy a layer one as most of the current offerings mm -hmm. didn't exactly suit what we needed to do with that burn mint equilibrium. That would be kind of hard to do over another blockchain. So layer one is in Ethereum, so your tokens will be Ethereum like ERC-20s? Um, theoretically, yes. Like if we forked Ethereum and mm -hmm. like went off that, yes, our tokens would be like on that ERC-20 token standard, but we would be our own token standard as our own layer one right. blockchain. And you, min you mentioned uh, staking in the app. What rewards percentage are you looking at on that stake? Um, typically, proof-of-stake systems are based on an amount of slippage as well as an amount of liquidity in a pool. So that would just be based on the amount of people utilizing it versus the token price at a given time. So not actually users could stake their tokens and earn a reward off of it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But you haven't set that percentage yet? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have to give the judges one to two minutes in between um, so they can write notes down and, and text their spouses good night and things. Um, I got a call last week from a group in uh, D.C., a Grameen Foundation, a fairly well-established foundation, Washington, D.C., and they typically help um, women around the world start businesses and so on, and they've used a, a couple of different uh, blockchain solutions, but they're looking at... Um, uh, in um, Kenya, um, creating a, a digital token that that incentivizes people not to cut down trees, and the idea is they have they'll have auditors come around measure the tree, and if it grows that year, they get so many tokens that represent the growth of that. And the idea is this is a new crop, which is a digital token that they can um, turn in and exchange for value. So. Um, I was talking over over the break here. I thought, you know, our, my generation's really screwed up the world, but we did it because we believe in you, and we didn't want to give <laughs> we didn't want to give you a trivial challenge on how to fix that. So we made some of these problems fairly substantial. Um, but I, I I firmly believe you're going to do it. I was in Wyoming with uh, Steve Lupian and the group there, and I was at a panel for the future of computing. And the head of the National Science Foundation was there next to me. He says, you know, we have to make sure the students get ethics training in, in future of computing. I said, really? <laughs> I said, all right, we, we just gave them all $300,000 of debt. We polluted their air and ocean so bad. And now you want to tell them about ethics. I said, maybe we should listen to them because I think they're going to solve these problems. <laughs> well, you're not supposed to say that to the National Science Foundation because they give us <laughs> about $50 million a year here at the university. So uh, that was probably not very smart of me to do. But that's all right. As you saw in the video, us hoodies are not up to good all the time. All right, we have one left. Uh, we've got Team uh, Bite Hogs and uh, Increased Campus Safety with Blockchain Blue Light System by Mycelium Networks. All yours. Thank Judges, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Clay, and this is Bite Hogs. I'm presenting the uh, Blue Light System. Uh, the current problem is increasing issue of not being able to 
feel safe in public areas, whether that's going through the park or walking around campus at night. Uh, previous system flaws include concerns that these devices are not effective or efficient and installing new ones can cost up to $20,000 and have a uh, annual maintenance requirement of $1,000. Uh, these do not provide a sense of safety as they are intended and due to the popularity of cell phones, the blue light systems have been done away with in a lot of cases. Uh, as I mentioned already, the yearly maintenance is around $1,000 per device, and each one costs about $20,000 to install. Um, it's a lot less cost effective than using a cell phone. Uh, the University of Colorado actually stopped using the system altogether in 2016 because more than 90% of the calls that they received were from pranks or hangups. The new, the new system is a device that can be removed from a bank and each one costs about $5,000. Uh, it offers real-time position tracking and onboard audio, as well as faster transmission speeds for emergencies. It's solar powered with a battery and there's also a flashing light when it is triggered. Um, Yes, yeah, so they are free to use for the public, so anybody can use them, and they are free, easy, and simple to use. They provide children and elderly with ease of access, and they also take advantage of current technology, expanded with availability. Um, most often it will be college students or runners and bikers. Uh, the benefits of the new system. Um, Having a device bank will allow a person in danger to grab and go. It can be disconnected from the bank. Um, utilize, it will utilize the Helium network for data transmission, which is reliable, fast, and cheap. Um, it's highly visible, widely available, and because it's solar powered, it is much more environmentally friendly. All right, the role of the blockchain. It will utilize a uh, the blockchain is a service access layer, which consists of two main components that track the cost of the system and track the usage of the system as well. Uh, as I mentioned, each bank of devices uh, costs about $5,000, and there are 10 to 20 individual devices per bank. So you think about five to $10,000 per campus that they'll be on. And the bulk of the cost comes from the bank or the housing itself, with each tracker costing less than $25. Uh, overall, the new system will cost significantly less to install and service, as well as be more environmentally friendly with the use of solar power. It will utilize new blockchain technology and most importantly, get help to the people in need. And that's it. Okay. The trackers be available in the little pods there, or are they distributed? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So the concept is that anyone walking by that feels like they're in danger can grab one of these pods and keep walking? Uh, yes, ma'am. And then That's correct. that will alert right. the system and it'll right. track so, that person? Yes. So as soon as it's taken from the pod, it will turn on, in a sense. And as soon as they feel safe or have gathered themselves, they can return it. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. So will it alert like the police to identify or know where this person yes, is? Yes, it will be. Um, it will be similar to the situation with these guys over here, where it was um, they were using the Helium network mm -hmm. to track using the nodes as it went across town. Um, we don't have as good of an example as they had. But if you remember on their map, as it was going through the town, it was alerting each node as it passed by. So it would be the same concept. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, uh, logistics. Um, so Catherine will be out there. The judge. Oh, by the way, I'd like to thank the judges. It's Friday night. They're volunteering their time. Um, w wonderful resources. Uh, they would like to spend time, get to know you, and and uh, talk more about your ideas. But uh, just thank you, all four of you. Thank you. So Catherine will be outside, take the judges upstairs for deliberation, which is probably where the single malt scotch is. Um, the rest of you uh, aren't allowed to go upstairs. Um, uh, Brahm's going to be speaking at uh, 7.15 will be when the keynote kicks off. So uh, I asked Brahm to come and speak um, speak to you. He's uh, um, If you're on the technology side, you've probably seen some of his stuff. So BitTorrent, for example, was something that... Uh, he created now ChiaNet. By the way, the folks in D.C. wanted to use ChiaNet for the Kenyan tree thing, so it's pretty amazing how sort of uh, these things, they tend to small world occasionally. Um, but uh, what I wanted Brahm to, to talk about and meet you guys was, you know, it would have been easy for him to go off and get a job anywhere with anybody, but he decided he wanted to, uh, start a company and, and be innovative and and that's a challenging decision to make and so I, I want him to ha have you guys have an opportunity to see what the, that's a bold decision most of us uh, don't make that decision even if we have a proprietary knowledge so that'll start at 7 15 and um, I think that's all I'm supposed to say here is that true Catherine okay <laughs> it's as I told the judges it's when your mom's 25 years younger than you <laughs> you get it's a different form of trouble you get in but uh, I'll stop speaking and uh, judges if you could uh, follow Catherine and the rest of you you've got about 10 minutes before the keynote in the main auditorium thanks <laughs>